Welcome to uh, the Government Games panel. My name is Alan Brooks. Uh, I was a uh, federal trust mentality employee for 10 years at the Kennedy Center, uh, the Arts Center, not space, uh, in DC. And there I became a part of a group uh, under the Obama administration called the Federal Games Guild, which was a non-chartered uh, cross uh, agency working group, and Elizabeth will tell you more about it. Um, but essentially, the takeaway from this panel is uh, the federal government is already using your tax dollars to fund game development uh, in a number of different places. And our panelists today are going to talk a little bit about ways that you as developers or you as citizens can learn about how those tax dollars are being spent on a thing that we all love. So um, we'll do intros and then slide deck it. That's great. Great. So. Great, I'm uh, Ed Metz from the Department of Education, and we miss Alan. He left us about a year ago, and he's still, he still is hanging awesome. out with us, though, so we got the best of all worlds. Um, so I'm with the Department of Education, and the programs that I direct uh, actually provide funding to game developers to create great tools to help students learn, and uh, I'm going to talk about that. And I'm Liz Newberry. I'm from the Wilson Center, which is a federal think tank. And I'm the director of the Serious Games Initiative at the Wilson Center. So this is a not complete slide of everyone who spent money on games uh, from the federal government. So uh, NEH, NEA, Department of Ed, NOAA, Wilson Center, Kennedy Center, uh, National Park Service has funded game development, and they're not doing a lot of this work in-house. And that's the thing that's really interesting, is that while some agencies do have their own game developers and simulation developers on staff, a lot of these are using their funds to hire external game developers or full companies to make games for them. Um, so like I said, I was at the Kennedy Center before this, uh, and I worked on two game development platforms there. One is the Romeo and Juliet LARP. Does anyone, everyone knows what LARPing is? So live action role play. Um, and I come from a theater background. So as soon as I started learning about LARP, I was like, wait a second, are you just tricking regular people into acting? And he said, yeah. I said, can I hire you? And he said, yeah. Um, so we, uh, along with a guy named Bjarka Peterson and a woman named Lizzie Stark, we developed Romeo and Juliet as a LARP experience for ninth grade students. And then the role-playing game system is a full, um, a full role-playing game rule set for teaching high school literature. And so the idea is, take, as a high school teacher, take any piece of literature that you already teach, whether that's Beowulf or uh, Lord of the Flies or Wuthering Heights or Pride and Prejudice, use the rule set and your students will make games to play in the classroom out of that essentially world book. Right, so we use the piece of literature as the world book. Um, they were very successful. I love doing them. Um, they're still available at the bit.ly link. Uh, if you're a teacher or no teachers, send them this way. I would love for them to continue to be used. Um, and like Ed said, I left the Kennedy Center to join a company called uh, Building Momentum. Uh, Building Momentum is a service disabled veteran owned small business. We teach people cool stuff. So I didn't leave the federal government completely. Our primary client is the United States Department of Defense and the Marine Corps. So my company teaches Marines how to do 21st century skills using things like 3D printers and laser cutters and welders and Arduinos, Raspberry Pi microcontrollers, drones, 3D scanning, all that stuff um, to better protect themselves and the people they serve near and around. Um, and we do that out of a place we open called The Garden, which is a co-working and, and workshop space in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you're local, come down and check it out. We have a world-class workshop, probably better than most in DC. Is anyone familiar with Tech Shop in Crystal City? It was a maker, no? Cool, we bought it, it's great. All that stuff's there now. Um, but we also, we don't just teach this stuff to um, the federal government, we also teach it to anybody who wants to learn. So if you have any interest in any of this stuff, let me know. So then, we're gonna skip Ed. <laughs> That's great. It's easy related. Smart. Um. <clears throat> well, I also wanted to give some background on what F 
GG was, uh, the Federal Games Guild. So I'll be talking a little bit about the Federal Games Guild first to kind of give the background on why us three are on a panel together, and then more intimately about the Wilson Center and the Serious Games Initiative. There we go. Yep. So I like to start out, because I'm a giant nerd, with the FFGG came out of a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. A rebel alliance was formed. Mostly under the belief that games could actually be used for social good and for education. So there was a band of people within the federal government who looked at this technology that we know as video games or digital games and computer games and was like, huh, these can be used for our missions. So the Federal Games Guild is an informal community of practice amongst federal entities and basically we're a band of misfits who believe that games can actually be used for mission goals, so for the goals of our various agencies. That's why we tend to take on a myriad of different practices. There's more information there and I have a QR code because I decided that technology was going to be my friend today. Do you know what I learned about QR codes? What? That the new iOS does them natively with your camera. It blows my mind. Nice. So if you have an app, an iPhone, you can just do it. It's great. <laughs> Okay. I didn't mean to see that on the That's okay. <laughs> Just really quickly, um, Google Slides ate my pretty uh, graphics here, but FGG basically falls into three different camps. And when I say this, there's a couple of different practices that our members tend to gravitate towards when it comes to games. Obviously, there's a lot of mixing and melding depending on their particular roles, but generally, there are three different things. We have people who fund games, right here. Uh, we have people who use it for outreach and education, also kind of all, everyone on this panel. And then we have people who research games and use games as part of a research focus. Yep. Again, very bluntly, we consist of those who use games for like training, education, outreach, that sort of thing. People who make games, like the Wilson Center actually develops in-house, Kennedy Center makes in-house, Smithsonian, a couple other agencies, NOAA, for example, make games in-house, and then others who work with developers. And then for all the developers, and there's also those who actually give you the monies, and I understand that's a very important part. And we'll um, have the bodyguard come out for Ed in the next few minutes. No, I'm kidding. Um, but this is not me. I work at the Wilson Center. Uh, nope, sorry. And no, nope, I just messed up my slide, sorry. Okay, the FGG uh, tends to come to a various bunches of meetups. Um, ones like oh, yeah, that's me. the, yeah, there's, well, where's Alan? I'm right here. Okay. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm wearing probably the exact same outfit I'm wearing right now. We don't just use them in-house or use them for private. We also are very much about supporting the ecosystem of educational games, games for learning and serious games. So we participate in such things as the Smithsonian Sam Arcade, Games for Change, Serious Play, and the Ed Games Expo happening next week at the Kennedy Center. Monday and Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday. Shameless plug. Um, for previewing sh future plugs. And the people that we tend to talk to um, as federal agencies fall into different categories. I thought this was important because it's, there's a lot of different ways that games education can manifest. But we tend to work with researchers and academic institutions. We tend to work with industry developers. Some of us work with the military, but it's kind of an outlier um, for our particular group. And also users and public educators. It's funny, when you're making games for education, we have this crazy idea that you should talk to educators and people who might be using the game. I know that's crazy, but we, we try to do that. Okay, that was a whirlwind adventure into FGG. Again, I can show the, the URL later, but if you are a federal employee interested in gaming and your mission for your agency, please do feel free to talk to me later. I am from the Wilson Center, which is a federal entity that was founded by Congress as a memorial to Woodrow Wilson. Fun pro fact, he was our only president that has a PhD, so they decided to make a think tank in honoring him instead of a statue designed for pigeons to land on. 
So we, are, we pride ourselves in nonpartisan thinking. We're very globally focused. We're an international think tank, again, because Wilson is primarily known for his international policy. For those who are studying for their high school exams, that would be the 14 points that he's known for. Yeah. <laughs> and so we are a big bridge between decision makers, policy makers, um, other federal entities and also academics, bringing the research to actually inform public dialogue. And that informs the way we approach games. Um, I, this is my obligatory slide that I have to include in every presentation. Look, we won awards. We're a transdisciplinary think tank. Uh, we tend to focus on how we can we bring divergent or different perspectives together to inform public policy. So the Serious Games Initiative Keeping in mind that we're a bridge between academics and decision makers was really founded around eight to 10 years ago. I wasn't there for it. But was founded with the idea that we can use games to help make otherwise really convoluted policy accessible to the broader public. We're sort of a rare bird within the federal sphere in that we make games for a adults, not K through 12. I know from seeing a lot of heads nodding, and this is a safe space to recognize that adults do play games. So we design games for them primarily. Yep. Some of our key design considerations, uh, sorry for the font coloring, but is we are nonpartisan. I cannot stress that enough. The Wilson Center is a nonpartisan institution as it is a federal entity. Oh, sorry. Ooh. I was trying to be clever to make the, all right, I ruined everything. We also really, again, this is, I was framing this more for uh, designers, but if you're designing for a federal entity, it's good to know their positionality with uh, their nonpartisan, that's a given for every government agency. Um, you need to know your agency's audience. For example, I mentioned the Wilson Center is oriented towards adults really more middle school to adult. And then also, but if you're designing for, say, Ed over here, maybe the audience is different. <clears throat> it is different, it's K through 12, generally. For, um, you, for your particular. Yeah. It's actually open, but okay. our awards tend to be K-12. K-12, okay, sorry. But you need to know who your agency is talking to, who the core audience is before you uh, try to pitch an idea to them. And the other thing is that federal entities try to bridge the, between research data or good practices and really trying to meet mission goals. We can skip to the next. All that said, the Wilson Center's legacy is in uh, budget games, which is uh, interesting for <laughs> our, our time and place right now. But um, we're focusing on civic education, particularly the history of the, the Serious Games Initiative. We had our first game, which was called Budget Hero. Really trying to think of how we can empower people to be uh, control their own learning when it came to federal budget policy. Again, it was nonpartisan, so your task was to pick different policies to save your city and be a superhero. Um, we use this as part of also a small uh, research component with what, what policies people gravitated towards and that sort of thing. But again, high impact was what we were looking for, making it accessible so that anyone from middle school and up could play this game. But it was played on the hill, it was played in middle school classrooms, civics classrooms in particular were very engaged with it. So did people on the hill actually learn something from it? Cause... <laughs> no? Uh, I wasn't here for that, but I can say with the next slide, uh, Fiscal Ship, which is its current rendition, the Budget Hero games, I will say that it, is, it does work well for multiple audiences. So I've played it on the Hill, I've played it uh, in China, I've played it all over the world. It's played uh, internationally, but also primarily in the United States. Part of the reason why it's so good is you can vary it depending on the audience. So if you're playing with, for example, a younger audience, you might give them assigned goals. You have goals that you generally meet to. Uh, so like if you want to support national security, or if you want to fight climate change, or if you want to shrink uh, entitlements, 
Those are all goals that you get to pick as the user when you start the game. Again, nonpartisan, we want to give people the flexibility to go with what values they are gravitating towards. Because the goal of the game is to demonstrate how you can decrease our national debt over the long term and what the impact of various policy is on that national deficit. It's about fiscal sustainability. It's not so much about steering any, towards any particular policy. And I'll keep the nautical metaphors to a minimum with the fiscal ship. But generally, the idea is that it uses Congressional Budget Office data to demonstrate the relative impact of different policies. And again, going back to the myriad audiences with Hill staff, generally, we like to play with competitions, like who can beat the game the fastest, because they know the policies very well. But if you're new to it, you might take a little bit longer. So the average playtime on, for example, classrooms, we designed it for around 30 minutes or so. Um, with a teacher educational tools to both set up the game and then also debrief afterwards. We integrated some more classroom based experiences like you can compare different policies amongst uh, different teams and those sorts of things. You can also, we heard from teachers that they wanted them to literally be able to print out their budget plan so we put that functionality in it. With, uh, with people all around the world, I, it's very flexible. I've seen people play it anywhere from five minutes, which is people who are very savvy, and then also people who play it for three hours, and God bless them for that. Um, there's a couple of people on YouTube who went through every single policy, and I, I applaud them for, <laughs> for doing that. Another game that we helped prototype at the Wilson Center um, was Cards Against Calamity. Don't be, sh don't be shellfish. We're all in this together. For my, for my next game, I'm hoping to steer away from was, the ocean. Was Woodrow Wilson, yeah, I was going to ask, was he known for his love of the sea? He was one of the first presidents to actually go transatlantic. Fun fact. Um, he also had to go back because Congress was, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you later. But, <laughs> but pity our, our NEH col colleagues aren't here to really bring the history to the fore. <laughs> but um, one of the biggest parts about this is that it was a board game. It was designed with NOAA Sea Grant funding for Sea Grant College uh, classrooms. So there's land grant universities, there's Sea Grant universities. These are ones that are endowed to focus on education around marine uh, education. So this was deliberately designed for a university classroom experience. So for example, hipsters can invade your town. Oh no, what do you do? Build um, a uh, artisanal coffee shop? That is not one of the options. I think that uh, I have to go back and look. But yeah, basically up the tourist industry is a particular option. Uh, pirates could also invade, which is my personal favorite card. But you also get actual uh, events that can come up. So for example, uh, fish epidemics, hurricanes. And the idea is to help people learn how to work together to enact policy that will make your coastal community more resilient. Again, very nonpartisan. Um, you can actually get this online. Uh, and there's also a digital version that the uh, Environmental Law Institute has produced and put out through First Playable produ Productions. So I won't go through every single point on this, but just in general, the FGG is really focused on supporting the ecosystem of educational games. We're always looking for, depending on our user and our agency, different practices that we can use to support the educational game industry um, and ecosystem for our various mission goals. And the Wilson Center in particular works with a myriad of different uh, social actors to support and to research and to design uh, various games. So I'm, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Yeah. So we'll go on to our friend Ed from Ed. Great. Thanks so much. So um, first of all, I was devastated just a few minutes ago because there was a, a Mets fan in the back row, and I was going to have a conversation with him right now, but he left. So I was very sad about that, but I'm going to go on anyway. Um, so I'm uh, from the Department of Education. That was not a segue. It was just sort of a random comment. Um, <laughs> Now, I first wanted to actually hear from all of you, who's interested in developing games for learning and education? Okay, that's, more uh, now. I, I, okay, great. Uh, if you're not here for that topic, um, I was you know, working with outdated polls. Sorry about right? that. I'm gonna <laughs> talk about that right now. Um, who's uh, developing games for learning right now? Great, great, okay. And then, um, 
you know, so here, hopefully I can give you a lay of the land and then some tips and then I'm available to talk to you over the coming weeks and months uh, to help you figure it out if that's your interest. So um, I direct what's called the Small Business Innovation Research Program at the U.S. Department of Education that provides funding from commercially viable education technology products for students, teachers, administrators, and regular and uh, special education. It's basically age three to adult because while we do tend to make our awards for K-12, our programs also provide opportunities for developers to create learning technologies for adults so they can learn basic skills in math and reading. So that's, that's a little known fact that now we've, we've gotten across the, across the board. Along with SBIR, uh, and I could do that just you to save you the agony you? of uh, trying to figure not out doing what, it I'm, right, what not I'm talking pressing about. Pressing the right time, that's fine. Uh, the Department of Education, we have the SBIR program. We also have a research grants program that's separate from SBIR. And these are programs that provide million, two million, three point five million dollars in funding. It's some serious funding. Um, so it's great to know about these programs. Across the government though, and Liz and I are working on this now, there are 20 or 25 different programs that you'd want to know about. Some of them provide the funding to developers straight on after you submit a proposal for funding. Others look to partner with developers to create games in-house or technologies in-house. And um, it's a complex uh, world to navigate, so our goal is to produce a one-pager yeah. Uh, in the next two days that we'll, that we'll be able to uh, provide five to Five point font, probably. Yes. So, um, so I'm here today to not go into too much detail about the funding programs, but to maybe give you a few examples of what we funded and then to uh, take your questions and, and see where it leads from there. So I, I always love to talk about looking back to education when I was a student and to the future of education, which is happening now. So this was um, how I learned about photosynthesis back in 1989 on Long Island. And um, it was in a textbook, and I was assigned the chapter. And the next day, the teacher talked about it uh, with a, a ruler on the board and pointed out the process. And sadly, this is still how students uh, I think in a lot of the country today learn. And a couple of years ago, we funded a project called Reach for the Sun by Filament Games. And it's, it's a game-based uh, approach to learning photosynthesis. So the teacher could assign this game to students the night before. And in the game, students have to plant a seed and they have to make photosynthesis happen with the oxygen, the nutrients, the rainwater, the starch, fight off insects and other issues, make sure it doesn't become winter and become too cold. Um, it's a lot of clicking, but it's uh, visually very rewarding and stimulating, and there's a nice musical score that goes along with it. And at the end, you build your sunflower and you jump up and down if you're a seven-year-old, like my daughter. Um, although my daughter cried hysterically when I, when I killed the sunflower in my first attempt because I didn't know what starch was, <laughs> the, the energy of the equation. And um, I said, well, the good news to my daughter is that it's a game and I can try again. <laughs> the sunflower really is not dead. We got it to grow. She jumped up and down. And I saw the magic and the power of a learning game firsthand. In any event, in, an, in and of itself, a student probably will not learn very much by playing the game in this case, but if a teacher then integrates it into a lesson the next day. The, 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 that horrible diagram that I showed could, be, could become a real life experience for those students. So I love to talk about this game and its power for a teacher to use it and to engage a student in a complex process. The next example is the wonderful ball and stick model that Sister Monica used when I was at Chaminade High School in the front of the classroom to teach me molecular modeling. And um, I'm not going to throw myself under the bus, but I did become a developmental psychologist and not 
uh, a molecular model scientist. In any event, it's, it's not her fault, it's my fault. Uh, kids today um, are still given a ball and stick model, and that's fine. And with it, an ex if, it, if it's in the hand of an expert, I'm sure it's an effective tool, and kids love to get their hands on it, but if they get their hands on it, it at home after school, it's probably not gonna serve much value. So, Shell Games created Happy Atoms. Happy Atoms is similar in a sense, it's just modernized with plastic widgets and balls and to, to um, simulate the, the, the periodic table and what would occur in it. But what's unique about Happy Atoms is there's also a reverse augmented, reverse augmented reality app that reads the ball and stick model that students create and tells them if their model is accurate or not. And if it's accurate, they get a harder challenge in the game. If it's not accurate, they're given tips on what they did wrong. So it gives immediate feedback to students and it engages them. And um, originally, I think it was developed for middle school students, but I've demoed this at different fairs that we've hosted the Department of Education and five-year-olds are making models um, and, and thinking about chemistry. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see that happen. So this is the next example. Um, and this is the type of worksheet that I got when I was growing up. I got this for homework and I, maybe I got the first three right because I was good at math because I love baseball, as you just already heard. Um, and, but then for some reason I had to do the next 19 problems anyway. And I thought to myself, my daughter and I will talk about her again. When she was in third and fourth grade five years ago, I thought, oh, well, thank God we're in the year 2015. Um, she's not going to have to do that drill and kill that I did. Lo and behold, she was getting worksheets just like this five years ago. And she still gets worksheets now. And it's frustrating to watch. And for students who can do the problems, it's a waste of time. For the kids who can't do the problem, there's no support except for a parent to say, well, this is how you do your long division, um, although they don't do it the same way anymore as they did 20 years ago. Um, in any event, what we funded now is a math game that uh, doesn't present the problems in the same way. It presents it in a different representation. In this case, students have to rotate the dial. It's a game called Was It Trouble? And it's a fun app. If you download it, you'd probably enjoy playing it just for fun. But in any case, you have to rotate your dial to free the cute little was it character in the middle of the jail cell there. But what's neat about it is um, it starts out easy and it gets harder. And then if, um, if a student masters the ultimate level, they've demonstrated mastery for topics that align to the curriculum in education. So that's the holy grail there. And then also if a student is lost and can't get through a tough challenging problem, it provides adaptive supports to support the student through that process, all while giving a teacher a dashboard to show which students are along the process. So in my career at the Department of Education, my dream on the day I retire is that we have a suite of learning game products that replace those digital worksheets and that even replace artificial grade levels that are occurring, but that test students' mastery of important content domains. It makes too much sense that why would a student just graduate without knowing things when in a game you can work your way up the levels and, and show that you know it. In our school system today, it's like, they're like, oh, only 20% of kids achieve mastery before high school or in high school. And you're like, well, that's, that's insane. Why, why would we stop? Let's give them technologies that can uh, allow them to, to do that. I think Ed, I made my Ed, point. Ed, can I just hop in and ask Thanks, real, please. real quick? Is there a place where I could go maybe on Monday and or oh, Tuesday? Oh, wait, I'm not there yet. OK. Don't steal it. I'm uh, sorry. Preview. 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 There's not. I thought you were going to ask, is there a list of games? Is there a list of games, Ed, that I could go to and find all these games on? Do any games do this? Um, and it's an open question. What do you want me to ask? 
I deserve that. I deserve anything that Alan gives to me. Uh, but anyway, this is my final example because um, the everybody's getting restless. It's, it appears on the panel, <laughs> um, like children on this panel. So this is the last example, and this is um, this one is just kind of mind-boggling in a lot of ways. Um, Minecraft, of course, for education shows a lot of promise because two billion students play it. Come on in. Don't run away. Sorry. We're super interesting and really fun. So this is a good game called Eco. Has anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can um, respond after I make my comments if, if I'm if I'm uh, out of you know off kilter. In any event, uh, Minecraft is where students build their virtual world. Eco is similar in a sense because a whole class of students is given a pristine virtual world that they have to build a civilization. And of course, what's exciting about it is there are not unlimited natural resources. So if you are a student who hoards everything, um, your classmates will get nothing. And that's basically how the game works. And it works in a 30-day real, real time. Um, and it's, the commercial version is available, which you might have tried. The, the student classroom version is not available yet because the developer it's taken a lot, a lot longer than expected, but we recently had a demo done by a former colleague of ours, James Collins, mm -hmm. who's now a teacher, and he's the best former colleague to have because um, he used to work in our job, which we work in file cabinets in the government, but James <laughs> went in the real world and is now a teacher, so a couple months ago I called him up and I'm like, James, can you demo this to your students? He's like, all right, so he got it going, and he produced a four minute video demo of his students and the world they built. And I was gonna play it right now, but James missed his deliverable. So I'll have it though today. I had a deadline for him. You're gonna we all find him on Twitter. And I'll, have it, him. I'll have it for you at five o'clock today. If you email me, I'll, you'll be the first one <laughs> we'll to see it. We'll put it in the document at the end. So, yeah. well, uh, but, but briefly, did you play the game of Eco or you just know about it? I have a question. Is it a shared, shared world experience? Yeah, yeah, multi-user. Mm -hmm. Shared world. Anybody else try it out? Okay. Well, let me know if you try it out. Um, it, I think it's very exciting for civics and democracy. Students have to create their own government. I think it's exciting for eco science learning too. Um, but why? Why isn't every school have an eco club after school? I bet every kid in the school would sign up. Um, and it makes too much sense to me. I'm not advocating for games, by the way. I'm just. Uh, Making an off the cuff remark. Okay, lastly, two more points and then we'll get on, on with it. Um, our next funding opportunity will open up January 15th at the Department of Education. Proposals will be due, due March 4th. If you've never thought about applying for a federal funding program before, um, it's probably not uh, gonna happen that you could put together the, um, the masterpiece in the next six weeks. But um, these programs happen every year and NSF has one due in June. And I bet if I talk to you enough times before that and you meet the right partners, you could, you could do it by then. But maybe you could get well, it done. Well, and the SBIR the program is across the, the federal government. Yeah, so yeah. The, most agencies have an SBIR program, and their dates are all different. Yep. Um, and they are um, an incredibly arduous yes. application process. There's a lot of writing Is the camera involved. on over there? Are we being, like, simulcast we somewhere? Are, yeah. Okay, I won't say anything then. <laughs> I mean, no, Ed, it's not, definitely. It okay. stays in the room. But it is a really hard process, so be mindful of that if you do want to apply for an SBIR. Find partners who have already done that. Um, reach out to your Ed on the inside of whatever agency you're working on and say, I need some guidance or some help. They'll do reviews with you if they're allowed to. Some are and some aren't, and there's a lot of resources out there to help you. So. And then uh, also, if you are interested in federal funding, it's it's a it's a huge learning curve. You got to throw yourself in and <clears throat> if, if it doesn't work out the first time, you've gone through the process and actually built your company's capacity in ways that you maybe yeah. wouldn't have otherwise. You're sort of forced to do that. And you know, the second time around, it's a, it's a better shot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lastly, I should have brought water. So Ed, is there a place where I can go play these games? <laughs> <clears throat> Lastly, the Ed Games Expo. Alan is the... Um, an initial founder Stop. for at the Kennedy Center. You 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 were in, integral to moving into the Kennedy Center a year ago. Uh, six years ago, 
we decided that we, we had all these really great learning games in the government, but we hadn't uh, highlighted them to the public. So we created an expo where the developers would come and demo their learning games. And that's the Ed Games Expo. So this year, it's at the Kennedy Center on Monday and Tuesday. We have 130 game, 130 uh, learning games plus technologies. So there's about 100 learning games that are going to be demoed. We have about 90 developers coming. We have 30 or 40 researchers coming. We have 35 or 40 different stakeholder organizations coming in the education technology universe. We have uh, 20 government program reps like ourself coming. So if you're in DC on Monday, um, I highly, re highly recommend coming to the office hours session at 2.30 because everybody's going to be sitting at a table for two and a half hours and you could talk to everybody in, in the little field of uh, education technology and games. Um, and then also, the, you can meet every developer who's demoing their games. And if you do come out, I'll give you a homework assignment. Uh, play every game and then send me a little report <laughs> on what you think. It will be private, just between you and me, but I would love to get your expert opinion on where we're at. I mean, I don't think we're, we're there yet, and it's really the most exciting time in the field and for education and learning. It's, it's just unlimited yeah. what, what we'll be able to do. So that's my story. I went on a little longer at the expense of <laughs> Mark and Lakiti. Ha, ha, ha. No, in true, in, in, in real seriousness, um, we're, we're very sorry for our, what our colleagues are going through. And we, um, we feel pain for them that they're out of work, not getting a paycheck, and not doing actually really important work. Um, so that's, that's it. OK. Um, I'll, and to your to your point about the federal uh, the um, the games expo on Monday and Tuesday, it's not just the developers that have been funded from the uh, from the SBIR program. You know, uh, Ubisoft comes and brings Rocksmith. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others that are yeah, there. Classcraft. Yeah, Classcraft is some there. Some big ones. Some big folks are there. It's a really yeah. cool expo. It's an opportunity to see something that you wouldn't normally in the Kennedy Center, which is games. So. So email me right now, and I'll send you the uh, roster, uh, the agenda, plus the ro the full roster of all the games. Um, so in uh, support of our our fallen furloughed oh. brethren, uh, very very quickly, um, the so games are art. The argument's been made and decided Smithsonian institutionalized games, we're done. So, um, we're putting on our Lakita Edwards. Yeah, from so NEA. this is for the, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, there's a grant for games in K 12, Writers in Schools uh, Digital. This was something that happened in Houston, Texas. They got awarded $100,000. Um, it was to develop writing and game based tech skills. So, it was actually about game development and writing. So, it was, get, it was that kind of program. Um, and again, it's a hundred thousand dollars to work on games funded by the government. Um, they have a bunch of professional development grants. Uh, you, if you are going to go for one of these grants from the NEA, you ha they are very. Um, they have some very specific guidelines. So my company tried to go for an NEA grant and was flat denied. Like Lakita just said no. Um, because we weren't a nonprofit and we weren't this and we weren't that. So you have to have some things in place. So you have to um, have a proven experience in the arts. Uh, you have to have sustained in-depth course of study and you have to be able to evaluate. Evaluation is a big part of all of these programs. Um, I would say as a non-funding agency, one thing that I would emphasize to anyone looking for funding is read the guidelines very carefully before submitting something, it will save you a lot of time and mm -hmm. heartbreak. Not no. throwing you under the bus. I'm just saying. No, I've heard throw that. away. And ours are 100 pages, uh, so it's an, oh my God. It's, an it's an afternoon. You gotta, you gotta be very disciplined. Um, I don't have enough discipline myself. We also didn't at SBIR. Oh, once. I didn't want you to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I, if you need Lakita, I'm gonna have her email here. Um, but this is her takeaway is embrace the A word. Um, so this is us. Lakita uh, from the NEA is not here. That's her email in the, in the top. Mark Ruppel from the NEH is uh, also not here. That's him on the right. Um, 
And if you need the rest of us, these are our contacts. And uh, this is a, I'll go back to it. Um, this is a list of all the games we talked about today and some other games that are funded. So use this too. And I'll, over the next, uh, how much time do I have left? 15 minutes, I'll just kind of go back and forth between these two slides. But let's, um, let's open it up to questions if you have any for our esteemed panelists. Yes? Index call and money, that's not to be affected by shutdown, is that right? No, sir. No, no. Um, that, uh, somehow it's not, because the Kennedy Center is also part Yeah, that of is shutdown. weird. Yeah. So we, we just got lucky. Yeah, so it's open. Great. Yeah, sure. Oh, so many things. Well, I'll give you a one-minute snapshot. Um, the, the concept gets you about halfway home. Um, and by the way, it's an independent review. We have independent panel reviewers. It's not me sitting there pushing a button ever. But um, the, the concept has to be, you know, transformative to turn the reviewer's head enough to, to get the job done. Mm -hmm. But other than that, can you develop it? Can you prove you have the team on board? Can you evaluate it and research it? Do you have an expert education researcher? Do you have experts in uh, practice, teachers, yeah. um, implementation specialists, and then do you have a business expert? So it's usually a team of four or five people, mm -hmm. but it all starts with the concept, and then the back end, do you have the commercialization pathways uh, already sort of in motion to get it to market? before you even develop it. So that's a pretty high bar. Ostensibly, you're writing a really massive report. And so from a functional perspective, it is 40 to 100 pages, depending on what you're including uh, for which program, whether it's yours or NEH or NEA or whatever. Um, you're assembling this massive report of, this is the game we want to make. This is how much it's going to cost us. These are the people on our team. This is our background. This is resumes for every person. This is letters of support from uh, 15 other people. And so there's just a lot of, there's a lot of yeah. collating of stuff. And while it varies from agency to agency, a lot of agencies have examples of past proposals. Like I know on Mark Ripple's um, mm -hmm. site, he has some that, he has three different threads for his grants, and he has an example of each, uh, including one from Tracy Fullerton from Walden the Game, which if you haven't played, is really fun, and I can plug it because I didn't have anything to do with it. So in other words, it's not something that one person can do with just a picture. Correct. No. no. The other side of the equation is uh, you get, in our case, 200,000 for phase one and 900,000 for phase two, but it's it's non-dilutive, you don't have to pay anything back. It's all yours. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't own any IP. So it's a hard uh, award to get, but it's the best award to get because it gives you $1.1 $1 .1 million to uh, shoot for the SARS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess you guys mentioned nonpartisan, you know, being nonpartisan earlier is really important. Um, do you guys have any advice for um, when developing games, like how to keep sort of your personal uh, politics or policies of your one of the things that we consistently do is come back to what research says. So the Wilson Center tries to take in all perspectives on a particular issue. That doesn't mean that we can't, we, if research is leaning a particular way and suggesting particular forms of approach, we tend to make sure to emphasize what research is saying. Because again, we're that bridge between good research informing public policy ideas. As far as an individual team, one of the things to do is just consistently ask yourself that question. Is this, am I showing bias towards a particular um, fan or a particular perspective? Trying to, in your beta testing or in your um, gray testing, to make sure that as you're asking people to look at this game, get feedback on the content, get feedback on the aesthetic, is it leaning a particular way? It's hard, so with the fiscal ship, for example, every single policy that goes into our game has a pro and a con explaining the policy in very accessible, I would even say basic words, like a sentence or two for and against and a description of the policy. And this is all vetted through a board that spans the entire um, length of the aisle. So both sides are represented on the board and 
the language is very heavily vetted. It's a very arduous process, but I think when you're designing for the public, it's an incredibly important process to make sure that you're getting it and making it accessible for everyone. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I, do you mind if I take it first and then? Oh, go for it. So one of the models that I like to use is iterative design. So every step of the process is really carefully going back to your core audience and who might be taking it uh, beyond your, your hands taking your baby out into the world as it were. Tending, and this goes back to what Ed was saying about forming a very solid team. So if you have the content experts and multiple content experts, multiple educational psychologists, those sorts of things, I think, again, it makes for a longer process potentially, but that iterative design process really does help you kind of cycle back consistently through the game design pro process and ensure that the product that you're producing is resp responsive to a different outcome than you might have originally anticipated. Yeah, I think your question's uh, great. It's a critical thing to think about uh, on two, two sides. Um, first, it's, you have to be very clear about what's gonna be developed in the initial proposal in our program or, or it's impossible to even come close to an award. But once you get the award, the funding um, allows for a creative process that you're going to iterate and, um, and find the right place for, for where you're at. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. One, uh, is it matching funds or is it principal? Uh, so that varies per agency, and I can't speak to the NEH or the NEA, but your funds? Our funds aren't matching because um, we we, uh, I mean, if you want to raise funds, that's great, but we don't want to force you to do that. Well, yeah. but I mean, my question is, do you require matching no. funds? No. Okay. Um, the second thing is, are you, um, are, where are you at in the virtual presence learning game versus the two-dimensional or even the tabletop? VR, you mean VR, VR yeah. AR? Okay. We have 15 uh, VR uh, demos at the expo maybe 20, um, uh, it depends. But, you know, that was one or two, two years ago, so it's, it's uh, tr you know, it's really growing, obviously. Yeah? Do you have uh, particular topics uh, that you're requesting for these proposals, or is it just kind of submit any game idea that you have? In education, the, the topics align to what students are learning in school, so that's pretty much the topic. So for, I can speak to the NEH because we just, uh, my company was co-developing a grant for them for uh, a game that we just got denied on. So thanks, Mark. Oh, no, um, all of us. That's all right. No, everyone's on my, on yeah. my list. Um, so far, I'm the only one saying But this is my here. point. But, but really, a quick aside, though, like, I have now submitted an application to three of the five in, you know, entities that have been up here in the last two years, and I've not gotten any of them, and they're my friends. Right, so like it is hard, right? It is a arduous process, and it is a really um, uh, highly competitive one. So, but for the NEH, what I was going to say is that they have a very stringent list of uh, topics under which your game can live, because they're the National Endowment for the Humanities. So it has to be humanities focused. It has to be about history or literature. Ours was Midsummer Night's Dream as a dating sim. It's a whole thing. Um, but the the point is that like we couldn't have applied for that game from the NEA. We could have probably sent it to you guys, and maybe should. March nineteen. Uh, March four. <laughs> um, so there's it, you have to just pay attention to what's on the website and what what each agency is telling you. 
Yeah. Great. So 10 a.m. on uh, Tuesday, we're having a VR for learning session. Part one is to talk about research and evaluation of uh, VR, which is in its infancy. And part two is to talk about distribution and commercialization models and having a widespread impact. Yes, and no, specifically, yeah. Yeah, nobody, I mean, talk to Shell Games when they're talking about their Holo Labs Champions um, game and what, you know, it's ready to go, How? but how can it be, um, integrated into practice, especially from an equity perspective. I um, mean, should the federal government be buying VR headsets for, for every school, you know? I don't know. Liz, have, we, have you, do you know if anyone's ever collated any of that data from the Guild? No, I think that American University actually, Ben Stokes, has been really looking intimately at the impact of games and how do we measure impact? How do we measure the value of learning from games? I think that it's also something that the federal government people that I have been talking to is are very interested in. So whether you're a funding agency or whether you're a development agency, having a rigorous way of measuring and evaluating the impact of whether it's a board game, a VR game, is incredibly important. So if you're ever working on a proposal that's for an RFP or a funding proposal, I would definitely, you can't just design a game and then go, there you go, have fun. We really do want to make sure that we are putting our resources to the benefit of the public good as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you send me an email, I'll send you the whole uh, agenda. We should have gotten you a t-shirt. <laughs> Can you on uh, Monday and Tuesday? Yeah. I warn you, as speaking as a former Kennedy Center employee, uh, don't park there. It costs like $100. It's not that much. It's, it's super expensive, yeah. Foggy bottom stop. You can walk if it's a nice day. Um, we had an ice storm last year. Yeah, we did. So I thought nothing worse could happen than that. <laughs> just a little bit. But just the shut down. Just shut down. Um, do we have any other questions? Anything to wrap up? We'll, yes, yeah, sir. Her name is Peg Steffen. She works at NOAA. No, she, no, she, she retired. retired. She what? retired. Yeah, sorry. Um, Never mind. We can talk with you offline. There's a couple of different. All right, one, one quick thought I had was yeah, there's a lab conducted by the CDC out of Pittsburgh. If you're thinking of it more as an in house training platform or more public outreach. Definitely for public outreach. Okay, sorry. I missed that. Okay, yeah, we can talk more one-on-one uh, -on -one and kind of figure out what resources might be available that could help you out there. So not Peg. Not Peg. <laughs> she is no longer in this area. Oh, She's man. retired. You, well, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a developer, but I work at Discovery Children's Museum, and a lot of these games are really interesting, but they're not as well What museum is it? Really animal. For Discovery Children's Museum. Up in Baltimore. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so how could I open the door to bring some of this type of stuff to the 
Yeah, you know, I always hoped the American History Museum would have a have a per permanent exhibit. Um, yeah. have, haven't been able to do that yet, but yeah, I think I think a lot of the developers would probably be keen on uh, providing the content, but I can't speak for them. But you can make connections for them, right? So oh, come, yeah, come to yeah. the expo or email me, and um, I, I'm certain uh, that developers would absolutely love that, and I think your your uh, attendees or your visitors would um, would would love that as well. Cool. Yeah. All right, that is the hour. Wow. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.